Our message this year is from the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, the spirit of grace for Rosh Hashanah. Verse 1 starts with the, the burden of the word of the Lord over Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Now, it's interesting that uh, this text is here in the beginning of chapter 12. This is not why I chose Zechariah chapter 12 for Rosh Hashanah. Actually, some verses later on that you'll see that apply directly to this theme of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, but also, it just happens to be, we've been doing a, a, a series on Zechariah, actually on the series of from the captivity, Jerusalem being destroyed by Babylon, 70 years in captivity, coming back, the book of Ezra, and Zechariah then in, in, in order with that. Uh, and it just happened to be last week we did chapter 11, so this week is chapter 12. But it falls right in with Rosh Hashanah, again, as we'll see in a few verses. But this verse also falls in, not so much with the biblical theme of Rosh Hashanah, but with the traditional, one of the traditional themes. And one of the traditional themes is it's a new year, and it's the uh, beginning of the High Holy Days. But it's also tradition that the world was created on Rosh Hashanah. And so, interesting, again, there's no biblical support for that, uh, but, uh, but that is a tradition that's been handed down over the years, and this verse reminds us that God is the creator. Thus says the Lord, who stretched out the heavens, who laid the foundation of the earth, who formed the spirit of man within him, right? God obviously designing and purposefully in that process, according to these verses. And so if we take the, the first uh, verses and first chapters of the Bible and say, well, it's kind of allegorical, it's not somebody understood literally, um, it's symbolic, and, and, and look at it that way, well, then we've got to take a whole bunch of other texts throughout the Bible, including this one and many, many others, and say, well, they didn't know what they were talking about. Zechariah didn't know what he was talking about. Even though he's quoting God here, thus says the Lord, <laughs> we either have to go that route with it, or we have to say, no, that was, as the Bible says all throughout, God was talking literally how he brought this world into being, how he brought mankind and life form on this earth. And I believe that is an accurate description. And I believe his uh, science, rightly understood, supports that. Geology and all forms of science support that, if rightly understood, looking at the Bible and comparing it with what we see on earth, what we see in people, what we see in the vast array of created beings, and even the rock formations support the biblical accounts. So God is the foundation. In the book of Zechariah, Zechariah was used by God to encourage the rebuilders of Jerusalem, rebuilders of Israel. Again, we were in captivity for 70 years, just starting to come back, and God used prophecy after prophecy through Zechariah and Haggai and others to encourage the rebuilding. And so by reminding us that the Lord, he created all things. Look at what he did out of nothing. Look at what he did out of dust. Recreating, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the city, rebuilding the nation, that's nothing for God. He is well able to do that. Nothing is impossible for God. Verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. So now he's prophesying. He doesn't say if. He says when they lay siege to Judah and Jerusalem. Now again, he's been encouraging them. Build, build, build. God's going to bless. God's going to prosper. God's going to do it. We're going to be able to do this. Zerubbabel laid the foundation. Zerubbabel's going to be there at the finishing of it. But now he's warning, yeah, but there's still going to be troubles. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to bless. Yeah, I'm going to be with you. Yes, things are going to move forward. But don't think all the sieges and the destructions are in the past. They'll come again. We'll be surrounded and there will be problems again. And sure enough, not in Zechariah's day or in Zerubbabel's day. But at least, if not other times, we can see the Rome coming and laying siege. We also had Antiochus Epiphany laying, not so much a siege or destroying Jerusalem, but changing its makeup. But Rome certainly coming and laying siege. 
God says he's going to make them drunk. He's going to make them mad. Make Jerusalem, anyone who comes against it, it's going to be as if they're drunk. Verse 3, and it shall happen in that day, and we'll see this phrase in that day over and over and over again. This is often a reference towards last days, and that's what Rosh Hashanah points us to, the last day, the last final days of judgment before the judgment of this earth. It will happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. And here I put up a cartoon, a political cartoon, and it's got people on there, but really don't think so much about the people. I don't want to think about it so much as a political cartoon, but how we're using here, as far as nations, nations coming against, as the prophecy says, it is all nations gather and gather against it. And so you have there in the drawing Netanyahu representing Israel, pulling a rope, and then on the other tug of rope there, you got uh, Mahmoud uh, bin uh, Dab, uh, do, Dud, the guy, you know, whatever. Who cares, right? And then you got a uh, ban from the UN, and you got the EU, and then you got Barack Obama representing the United States, all pulling against Israel, but they're not able to pull it down because God has his finger, right? And he could have even used his pinky, right? God has his hand over Jerusalem and over Israel, and he's watching over it. And this was done back in 2009. Interestingly enough, Netanyahu's still the Prime Minister of Israel, <laughs> over a decade later. And uh, the other guys, they're all no, no longer in charge of their positions they were when this picture was drawn. So God has sustained down through the ages. Again, that doesn't mean they won't lay siege. They will lay siege. There will be problems. But God has his special hand over his people. And Jerusalem here, I will make that day, I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone. And it's not in only reference to the literal city of Jerusalem, although I believe that applies, and to, but to the people, the people of Jerusalem, and not really just the people of Jerusalem, but the people of Israel, and not just the literal people of Israel today, but, but people of faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? God's people, right? The people of peace, God's people of peace, his city of peace, his Israel, his overcomers with God, those who are faithful to him and following him and listening to him. God will make anyone who comes against us a heavy stone. Will make us a heavy stone against them, not able to lift, not able to push. In that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. So again, similar thing. Again, third verse in a row here. This trouble's going to come, trouble's going to come, but I will help you. I will protect you. I will stand there with you. And another political cartoon. This one way back from 2006. It was the same theme, same thing over and over again. All the nations of so this guy there on the left, the UN, representing the UN, the US, the EU, kicking Israel. Israel there laying on the ground, tied up, feet tied up, in the chair. Uh, being called a warmonger, and the Pope, you're hurting civilians and poking them, and Putin there representing Russia, and a faction stand down, and Egypt representing the Arab League there with Mubarak. Don't escalate violence, right? So blaming Israel for defending itself. And that's how it's always been, right? Attacks, attacks, attacks. So not only those who are bringing the attacks and causing the attacks, and even right now as we speak, Hamas is still sending balloons. They did last year and before that, and they're still doing it. Balloons and, 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 and little planes and aerial devices and drones with fire attached to the bottom. And then they land it on the other side. They let the wind take it over into Israel and burning thousands of acres of, of forests and farmland. Total, devastating, horrible, horrible things. If that was done from one country against any other nation in the world, it'd be strongly condemned and, and, and the nation that's being attacked strongly supported. There's not a word, hardly any word in the press about that at all. And actually, in contrast, the UN Security Council over and over and over again condemns Israel for everything. 50% of their condemnations 
of, there's over 200 nations in the world represented there. And of all the 200 nations in the world, with some horrible, horrible atrocities against their people and against other people, bombing their people, gassing their people, imprisoning their people, enslaving their people, and again, attacking others, murdering and kidnapping and Boko Haram and others, not a nation, but within the nation, and Hezbollah, basically, rules that nation, Lebanon, doing horrible, atrocious things. Very little condemnation. Out of all those countries, 50% of all their denunciations are against Israel. A country that's smaller than New Jersey. A country with a population smaller than many cities. And yet it is the cause of 50% of all the problems and all the atrocities in the world for the UN to focus on. It's horrendous. That's what the Bible prophesied way, way, way back in Zechariah's day. That in that day, all the nations of the earth will be against you. And we're literally seeing the fulfillment of that. While there's peace accords and other things, still is condemnation taking place whether among the people, even in those countries that have peace accords, or through the UN, or many other means, or just anti-Semitism. And again, any, anti against anyone who's really truly following God. Because it's not human, right? Our, flesh, our war is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the nations of this earth. It's against the devil. And the devil stirs up all who are opposed to God and God's people. It says he will make them mad, strike confusion upon them, Make them as if they're drunk. Make as if it's like a stone that they can't lift, a heavy stone. And that's what's happening also. The Bible says in Proverbs that all who deny God, who all who say there is no God, they are fools. And God's making them fools. They're making fools of themselves. A ridiculous, crazy notion. Those who are against Israel, those who are against um, God's people, those who are anti-Bible and anti-anyone who's truly following the Bible, they speak foolishness. Their arguments are just foolishness. There's no logic. There's no reason. In full denial. And yet God still has us here. From Zechariah's day, from before Zechariah's day, and attempt after attempt, the Antioch Epiphanies, the Hamans, the, the Romans, the Crusaders, we're still here. God's word is still here. Attempt after attempt to annihilate it, to crush it, to burn it, to do away with it. And miraculously, we're still here. Because God's finger, God's hand, because God's word says. There's been martyrs, there's been troubles. There have been whole villages that have been rounded up and put into a synagogue and burned. There are young Christian girls in Africa being rounded up and kidnapped and raped and killed and murdered. Routinely, very little spoken out condemning that. It's happening. It's happening around the world. God prophesied it would happen. But yet he will maintain a remnant to the very end. And as a whole, we will succeed to the end. And those who perish before, there is a resurrection. God will awaken them at the last trump. And even though we blew the trumpets here tonight, that wasn't the last trump. Even that Takiya Gadola wasn't the last trump. That was the last trump for tonight. But Yom Kippur will be the last trump. So bring your shofars back on Yom Kippur for the last trump. And at the last trump, God will raise his people who have been martyrs down through the ages. Verse 5. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. It's the people. It's not the buildings. It's not the stones. It's not the walls. It's not the roads. It's the people. Governors of Judah will say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, God's people is where the strength is. As we unite together, not only in a singular city, as we unite together wherever we are in the world, as we unite together as a congregation here locally, as we unite together in heart and mind, in God's word, 
That is where the strength is. That is where the power is. In the unity that God calls us to. That's where the strength of the Lord is found. That's where the power is found. They will know that you're believers by your love for one another. That we take on the mind of Yeshua. As Yeshua prayed, Lord, that they might be one as you and I are one. That oneness that he wants us to have. As one united people of God. Standing by faith. Holding fast together. Loving the Lord with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And loving our neighbors as ourselves. Putting God first, others second. It's a miracle of God. That's not natural. That's more miraculous than God sparing us down through the ages. That is easy to do. It's easier than God creating the earth out of nothing. Or it's harder. You're God creating the earth out of nothing, that's easy. But causing people to love one another, causing people to come together in unity of heart, mind, faith, strength, caring for one another, bearing one another's burdens, working together, that's a miracle of God. That's where the strength of the Lord is. In that day, I will make the governors of Judah like a fire among trees and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding people on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. God has sustained us, and yes, again, even after the destruction by Rome, God has brought back Jerusalem, and people are living again in Jerusalem. It's absolutely amazing. It was amazing enough after 70 years to rebuild. How much more after close to 2,000 years? And again, as far as a literal city with literal people in it, but even the people of God worldwide. And the Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not be greater than that of Judah. God's glory will be revealed in his people, and it will be great. It will be very great. In that day, verse 8, in that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And again, over and over through this chapter, in that day, in that day, in that day, in that final day, God will defend the inhabitants. He will make the feeble like David. And that's where the strength is as well, in our realizing our feebleness. As Paul said, when I am weak, that's when I am strong. Thus, the weaker we realize we are. And we don't have to become weak. We already are weak. <laughs> well, the quicker and the faster and the more we realize our weakness, the more we realize that without God, we can do nothing, absolutely nothing. Right? Try breathing on your own someday. Right? We can do nothing without him. That's when we're strong. He will make the feeble like David. Like David, well, who is David? David, the shepherd boy, whose father didn't even care about so much. The prophets come into the home. He brings all the sons together, all except David. David's left out in the field and nothing. He's the youngest runt. Left him out in the field with a few sheep. Little David. Not recognized by his father, not recognized by his brothers. Brings food to them in the war. Oh, what on earth are you doing out here? Go back home. Go back to your sheep. Unrecognized, feeble little David. Even the giant laughed at him. You send, what am I, a dog? You send this little flea out here? And David realized his nothingness. I don't come at you in my own strength. I don't come at you in my own power. I don't come at you in my own abilities. I don't come at you with armor. It's not these stones that are going to bring you down. 
I come at you in the name of the Lord God Almighty, the King of the universe, in his power, in his strength. Thus the feeble will be like David and be able to bring down the enemies that come against us. And again, it's not flesh and blood. The enemy of temptation, the enemy of doubt, the enemy of discouragement, the enemy of fear, the enemy of jealousy, the enemy of hatred, the giants in the land. Discouragement. Bitterness. In the name of the Lord, they shall flee. Any, every enemy shall tremble. Every wall shall fall at the name of the Lord God Almighty. And that giant Goliath came tumbling down at the name of the Lord and with a little stone out of a little sling from a young boy. The more humble we are, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up as we come before him and surrender before him. And that's again part of this theme of Rosh Hashanah. Entering into these 10 days, entering in on our prayers, entering in humbly confessing our sins, asking the Lord to have mercy and forgiveness upon us. Not hiding, not covering, but confessing and forsaking. He'll make us like David, a man after God's own heart. David was strongest when he was down on his face, praying and seeking the Lord. David didn't have it easy. We won't have it easy either. Running and having to hide from Saul, living in a cave. But God sustained him and supported him throughout. And he will sustain us and support us to the very end as we stand with him. He'll make us, like it says, like the house of David will be like God. Not be God, but like God. Yeshua said, that even more you shall do, even more than these things you shall do. Again, as we unite together as a house of God. So we a house of David as a house together, united together. Power of the Lord demonstrated like an angel of the Lord going before us, slaying the enemies before us, bringing their lies down. And then we become overcomers. As Yeshua said, overcome as I have overcome. Shall be like God, overcomers. Overcoming by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Those that overcome, I will make the pillar in my house. I'll write on in my new name, overcomers, like David, like God, like the angel of the Lord, as we submit before the Lord and surrender to him. Verse 9, and it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And again, in that day, and again, God will Drive them mad, bring them confusion, make them like they're drunk. Make us an immovable stone. And God will destroy, like in Daniel chapter 2, the stone that comes cut out of the mountain without hands, human hands, and destroying all the nations of the earth. All the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I believe there will be a literal attack on God's people, on Jerusalem whether with tanks and planes and guns or not, whether Cyper or whether attacks from the UN and condemnations and one way or another. And again, there are already many, many attacks. But again, not only on the literal city, but on the people of God, the city of God, the children of God. The attacks will be and some with swords, some with guns, some with shields, some with rocks, some with bricks. Others with edicts and laws, unjust, with imprisonments, banishments, 
Yeshua said, well, if they've hated me, they will hate you. They will cast you out of the congregations. They will kill you thinking they are doing God's service. The attacks will come. But in that day, God will destroy all the nations that come against God's people. He will stand. He will protect. And if history repeats itself, and I believe it will, he will do so at the last moment. Not before then, but at the last moment, he will be there. He'll part the Red Sea at the last moment. He didn't spare Hananiah, Mishael, or a bit, uh, uh, Hananiah, Mishael. I'm thinking of his Hebrew name. Whatever. Sorry. Azariah. Thank you. Azariah. Uh, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But God stood there with them in the fire and delivered them out. God will take us out of the grave. God will take us through the fire. He'll give us the ability to endure to the end. And he will destroy the kingdoms of this earth. They will all go down. Again, as all the prophecies, not just Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. God will step in and will destroy the nations of this earth. As when Jerusalem was laid siege under the time of Hezekiah. Hezekiah prepared. He did all that he could in God's strength. Diverted the water from the spring of Siloam, uh, the spring of Shiloh down to the pool of Siloam. The tunnel is still there. We walk through it to bring water inside. Built large walls mentioned in the Bible. The walls are still there today. We go and visit the broad wall that Hezekiah built to stand against the Assyrians as they were attacking, as they surrounded Jerusalem, attacked and destroyed the major cities around Israel and Judah, and prayed. Hezekiah prayed and with Isaiah and laid the denunciations of Shenacherib before the Lord. And in one night, the Lord sent one angel and killed close to 200,000 armed soldiers. One angel. God is able. We still need to be preparing. We still need to be praying. We can still be doing our part, following God's word and following God's law by God's grace. But God will step in and do his part. That's what he promises. And so while all those verses up to this point have been great and powerful and helpful, that's not the reason necessarily for using it for Rosh Hashanah. It's this next verse that really brings the theme of Rosh Hashanah home. All these others, in that day, in that day, last days, and we're certainly living in it. But it's this next verse which brings it home to our heart. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. What an amazing prophecy. From the book of Zechariah. Prophesying that one will come. The only begotten son will come. The firstborn of creation will come and he will be pierced. As King David said in Psalm 22, they will look on me as they pierce my hands and my feet. And we it's prophesied that not only will he be pierced, this only son, this firstborn, but in seeing him, it will bring grief to us. It'll bring mourning to us. It'll bring repentance upon us. And God has begun the fulfillment in that, of that. 
2,000 years ago at Shavuot, after Messiah was pierced, 50 days later, gathering together, disciples praying and praying for 10 days. And God's Spirit poured out upon them. And the Holy Spirit using them to speak in many languages that people could hear and understand in their own native tongue, their own native language. And as Peter preached and spoke about the Messiah whom they killed and crucified, it brought a spirit of grief and mourning upon them that they cried out, what must we do to be saved? Peter said, repent and be immersed for the remission of your sins and for the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And that very day, 3,000 people in Jerusalem, and then later on, 5,000 people, and every day more and more a spirit of mourning, a spirit of repentance, a spirit of grieving came upon them. And it wasn't them. Nor was it the Romans. It was you and me that pierced him. It was our sins that he died for. It's for our transgressions, that he was whipped and striped. It's for our iniquities that he was beaten and bruised. For our sins, he was pierced. He took our sins upon him. And he paid the ultimate punishment for it. And not just death, not just death for three days, not just beatings and lashes and skin pulled out and thorns and hung, but the dying of eternal death, the dying of the second death, the dying of the death of separation from God. the receiving of our punishment that we deserve, that he who knew no sin, perfect in all his ways, became sin. That we who know no righteousness, who have no righteousness in ourselves, whose any righteousness is like filthy rags, that we, should be made the righteousness of God in him. That we should be made sons and daughters of God. Absolute amazing substitution. Like the ram being substituted for Isaac. Yeshua was substituted for us, paying the price of eternal damnation for us. And as we look upon him, as we see him as he really is, as we see him in the last moments here on earth, we will mourn for him, for we have pierced him, for we have thrust him through, for we have killed him. And when we stop comparing ourselves with ourselves, when we stop comparing ourselves with others, and we compare ourselves with him, we will see ourselves in our true condition. We will see ourselves in our true feebleness. Oh, it's so easy for us to think, oh, well, I'm better than others. It's so easy to think, well, hey, I'm better than I used to be. But the judgment will not be graded on whether or not we're better than someone else. The judgment will not be based on whether or not you're a little better than you used to be. 
Judgment will be based on how do you and not me, I, compare with Yeshua. That's going to be the comparison. You may say, well, that's not fair. <laughs> he was perfect. He was without sin. Yes. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all our sins. Of all our un, un, of our unrighteousness, and He is able to present us before the throne of grace without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. That He will remove our carnal nature again. That's what He died for. He already died for it. He already took it upon Himself. Thus, it's no longer yours. It's no longer mine. It is. And we can receive the Holy Spirit, that we can receive the righteousness of God in him, that we can be partakers of the divine nature, as it says in 2 Peter chapter 1, filled with his spirit. Again, the more we realize our nothingness, our feebleness, the more he can fill us with his righteousness and present us covered in his righteousness. So that when we stand in that day of judgment day, God does not see us. Our record of sins is blotted out and removed and covered in the blood of the Lamb. And the Father sees only Yeshua. And that's what the judgment will be about. Verse 11, and in that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, the wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and the wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and the wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. There's a corporate repentance, there's a corporate love, there's a corporate unity that we need to have to sustain us down to the last days. But in the judgment, we will stand alone with Yeshua. And that's it. We won't be able to stand because of our parents. We won't be able to stand because of our spouse. We won't be able to stand because of our children. We won't be able to stand because of anyone else's good deeds. Yeshua and only Yeshua. We stand alone. There's time for corporate repentance. There's time for corporate prayers. There's time for individual mourning for our own personal sins. Oh, it's easy to confess the sins of the world. It's easy to confess, and it's good for us to do that, and it's easy to confess the sins of others. But these 10 days of awe, before the day of judgment, we need to be in personal prayer, allowing God to search us and try us, try me, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And let the Holy Spirit come down upon you and me individually and give us a grief, a sorrow, the gift of repentance, the gift of confession, the gift of a transformed heart and life by his power and his might. And that is the theme of Rosh Hashanah as we enter into these 10 days of awe, preparing for the day of judgment, the final day of judgment. And looking at the scenes in the world around us, what is taking place, the madness that's taking place, the drunkenness that's taking place, the confusion that's taking place. This very well could be our last Rosh Hashanah together. I believe the Lord could come 
I believe the final events will be rapid, and I believe things can wrap up very quickly. We need to be ready. We need to be praying. As a congregation, we've been praying every day of this month. Different people have picked a different day throughout September. And we need to continue to be praying throughout this month, throughout the next 10 days, and throughout this month. Really till the end, till the physical end. Again, this 10 days is really just symbolic. This Rosh Hashanah is it's the symbolic of the end of the year, because on a yearly cycle, we're reminded, but it's symbolic of the end of Earth's history. Of the last days, and I believe the shofars are being blown. I believe it's loud and clear. If we can't hear the message of what's going on in the world, if we don't see the Holy Spirit withdrawing out of people's hearts and minds, if we don't see the madness going on, and yet we don't, don't see God's protection in special ways at the same time, then we're not hearing the shofar. We're in the last days. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to get other people ready. We need to trust in the Lord. Hang on by his grace and by his strength, endure to the end. Because he will come and he will defend and he will sustain and he will protect and he will strengthen us and he will help us and he will stand by our side and he will fill us. And he will do miraculous things in us. And like David and like Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, be able to stand faithfully for him, no matter what comes. The glory of the Lord will be revealed. And so as we prepare to pray together tonight, God's been revealing to you a need to Sense more and more your feebleness before him so you can receive more of his strength. Then a moment when we pray, confess your weaknesses, ask for God to show them more to you, and ask God to strengthen you and make you like David, make you like the house of David, to make you like Yeshua, to make you like the angel of the Lord. If you're seeing Yeshua more clearly and it's bringing a repentance upon you, you're seeing yourself in comparison with him who is all love, who is all mercy, who is all forgiveness, who is all justice, who is all balance. And it's causing and bringing a mourning in your heart and mind. And as we pray, confess that before him, bringing a true sorrow for how our sins, your sins have crucified him afresh. In a moment when we pray, you can receive forgiveness and his mercy. And if that's not happening, we can pray and ask God, Lord, give me your spirit. Give me your, pour out your spirit of grace upon me and give me that sorrow for my sins. Awaken in me a spirit of repentance. And if you want to join together in praying for God's protection over his people worldwide, for Jerusalem, for Judah, for Israel, and again, people of faith in the word of the Lord, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those connected, those grafted and regrafted in. So we pray together as we unite together, as we bond together, as a family together, uniting together in him. In a moment when we pray, you can do that, pray that. If you want to commit to making these next 10 days a day, days of soul-searching prayer, and as we pray, ask God to do that for you. Don't just, I'm going to do that. But God, hold me fast. God, wake me early. God, speak to my heart and mind. God, give me your spirit of mourning through this time. Let us pray together. Our Lord and our God, ruler of the universe, we praise your name for your sustaining power in the past, for creating by the word of your mouth, for defending time and time and time again, 
for uplifting time and time and time again, for rebuilding time and time again, for forgiving and cleansing and restoring and renewing and transforming and changing. Do that again and continue to do that in our hearts and minds. Work mightily through us. Even greater things do through us. Blow the shofars through us. Use us in announcing and getting your message out there, your message of warning. Use us and go before us like the angel of the Lord and prepare hearts and minds to receive your truth before it is too late. Give us the ability to work while it is day, for night is coming when no one will be able to work. So pour out your spirit upon us. Grant us your gifts. And miraculously speak through us. Taking this gospel to every nation, tribe, kindred, and people. For your name and your honor and your glory. And sustain us and hold us fast. And the work you've begun in our hearts and minds bring to completion. In Yeshua's holy name. Amen.